Catoctin Creek is a proud supporter of Bourbon Pursuit. At Catoctin Creek, they pride themselves on making traditional rye whiskey as it would have been made in the 1800s. Virginia grain, Virginia water, Virginia barrels. Catoctin Creek, the Virginia rye whiskey. This is brought to you by Smooth Ambler, a proud member of the Bourbon Pursuit family. Smooth Ambler builds on the traditional roots of American whiskey through innovative blends, proudly sourced whiskeys, and a unique line of their own homemade bourbon and rye recipes made in West Virginia. So venture off the traditional trail and go see them in Maxwellton, West Virginia. They'd love to welcome you to the family that they're building around their whiskey. Wilderness Trail is sweet mash Kentucky straight bourbon and rye whiskey made by master distiller Shane Baker and fermentation expert Dr. Pat Heist. Whether it is high rye or weeded, cask strength or bottled and bond, Wilderness Trail is always non-chill filtered premium whiskey with unparalleled flavor. Distilled, aged and bottled in Danville, Kentucky. My wife just said, what the hell is going on in there? She's hearing me yell. (laughs) So maybe I need to turn it down, but I don't know. (laughs) Turn it up. This is episode 307 of Bourbon Pursuit, the podcast featuring news, reviews, and interviews with people making the bourbon whiskey industry happen. I'm one of your hosts, Kenny Coleman, and before we start today's podcast, with the 57th Bourbon Community Roundtable, here's your weekly bourbon news update. Wild Turkey is reintroducing its staple, Wild Turkey 101, in a redesigned package. This new bottle design, which will be available for both the bourbon and rye expressions, will feature an embossed wild turkey in place of the original printed label, as well as a new minimally designed label with updated vibrant colors. Evan Williams Bourbon announced the 2021 class of veterans selected as American-made heroes. Each veteran's picture and story of service of their active duty or their civilian life will be featured on the side of a special edition of Evan Williams' Black Bourbon label. The 2021 Evan Williams American-Made Heroes were selected from more than 472 grant applications and are going to be featured on more than 474,000 bottles available nationwide. To date, Evan Williams has recognized 42 veteran heroes on its American Hero Edition bottles and donated more than $375,000 to nonprofits. Now, moving on to bourbon release news. Barrel Craft Spirits has released Barrel Bourbon Batch 29. It's a blend of straight bourbon whiskeys featuring barrels of ages 6, 7, 9, 10, 14, and 16 years old. These were all either distilled and aged in Kentucky, Tennessee, and Indiana. And it's bottled at cash strength, which is 115.88 proof, and will have a suggested retail price of $90. Logstill Distillery is releasing its first product line called Monks Road 5th District Series Bourbon, which pays homage to the historic tax district of Central Kentucky. The rotating series of hand-selected spirits will honor nearly lost pre-prohibition distilleries, starting with the Southern Nelson County's Cold Spring Distillery. It's a six-year Kentucky bourbon, Bottled at 100 proof with a mash bill of 75% corn, 21% rye, and 4% malted barley, and has a retail price of $80. Bob Dylan's Heaven's Door has a new limited edition release in partnership with Red Breast Irish Whiskey. It's a 10-year aged bourbon finished in Red Breast single pot skill casks for 15 months that has also been formally used for Spanish sherry, and it's been named the Master Blenders Edition. From Master Blenders Ryan Perry and Billy Layton, This collaboration has been in the making for two years, trying multitudes of blends and finishes. It'll be released at 100 proof and $100. Buffalo Trace is releasing a one-time only edition of Warehouse C Bourbon in the E.H. Taylor lineup. This 10-year-old bottled and bond bourbon was aged in Warehouse C, built by Colonel Taylor in 1885. Half of the barrels in this release came from the second floor and the other half from the fifth floor. The six bottle cases will also be shipped in wooden boxes, modeled after the wooden crates that were used by Taylor to transport goods during the days before Prohibition. And it's going to have a suggested retail price of $70. For today's roundtable, we tackle a new topic that took most of us by surprise. About three weeks ago, I was doing a label approval for a Four Roses barrel we selected, and I was given an additional contract to sign that was called a non-mutilation agreement basically stating that we agreed to not add any stickers, wax, or really anything that alters the package. Will other distilleries start following suit? And what happens if somebody breaks the contract? We give our opinions on that, plus if we think blends 
are going to become the new single barrels. And Joe from Barrel Bourbon wants you to know that it's gotten a whole lot easier to get their unique cash strength whiskeys from around the world. Just visit BarrelBourbon.com and click the Buy Now button. Bourbon to your door. It's as easy as that. Enjoy today's episode. And now here's Fred Minnick with Above the Char. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. This week's idea comes from Andrew Turner, or at aturner02 on Twitter, who writes, uh, Describing a bourbon whiskey as smooth, is that a no-no? I feel like it's everyone's go-to when they can't describe what they like in a pour. I personally think it's a terrible, terrible adjective. What are your thoughts? Here's the thing, Andrew. First of all, thank you for writing. I think people over, I think we over kind of beat up the term smooth. The term smooth is really meant to be a, an indication of uh, heat. It is not meant to say it tastes good. It is an actual term that we use within the industry uh, to talk about its like burn levels. And here's the thing, what burns for me will be very, very different than what burns for you. And this is the greatest description I have ever heard anybody give to the meaning of smooth. And it comes from Bourbon Hall of Famer Jim Rutledge, former master distiller of Four Roses and the man behind Bull Run and Crema Kentucky in the modern sense in terms of like the bottles that are out there. Just incredible palate. One of the greatest distillers of all time. Jim Rutledge is amazing. Jim talked about like how if it burns at any point, like really burns at any point on the way down until it gets to your belly, then it is not smooth for you. Again, smooth for you. And I've added to that as saying like a lot of people misunderstand uh, a burn for alcohol spice. So alcohol spice, it's kind of like, a tickle, if you will, uh, like a Tabasco sauce will fill on the powder. It, it tickles, but it doesn't necessarily burn. Whereas a 9-volt battery, boom, you put that 9-volt battery on your tongue, that son of a gun is burning. And so, like, smoothness is really just an indication of the heat of the bourbon for that individual. It varies from person to person. So when you hear someone say smooth, Andrew, you're absolutely right. You're welcome to dismiss it, and you're probably right for doing so. It's a personal preference as to what is smooth for everybody. But here's the thing. It's not a flavor note, and it is just a measure of the heat. So that's going to do it for this week's Above the Char. Hey, if you're like Andrew and you have an idea for Above the Char, make sure you hit me up on any social media platform. Just look for my name, at Fred Minnick, or go to fredminnick.com and shoot me an email. Until next week, cheers. Welcome, everybody, to the 57th recording of the Bourbon Community Roundtable. It's a fan favorite, a crowd favorite, one of our favorites because we like to take on a potpourri of bourbon topics and kind of what's hot and what's new in the bourbon world. It's been four weeks since our last one, so we're super excited to be able to take on a slew. Uh, well, not really a slew. There's really one major topic, and then if we have time, we'll get to a second one. I have a feeling that we will take this on for, for quite a while here. But let's go ahead and let everybody kind of introduce themselves as we always do. And I guess before we do that, Brian, how's it going, buddy? Crap, I wasn't on mute. Uh, I'll just, <laughs> You're here now. I'll just keep it down. No, I'm good, man. I'm excited to be here. It's a great night uh, here in Kentucky. It's hot. And so is the topic. So I'm ready for it. And we are missing one member of the crew here tonight. So Fred is not here to join us, even though we've got, uh, he was trying to get us to move this up and do recordings earlier so he could be a part of it. But I stuck to the schedule because that's, that was my preference. So <laughs> yeah, he's got haircuts to do. So yeah, he's got some haircuts. Peyton Manning interview, you know, we're just peasants now. You know, it's true. Part. It's true. We've, we've got to figure out how to come out with a, a, a he's already two. forgetting about the people that brings him to the dance. You know, he always talks about that. The bourbon <sighs> brands, he's, Doing a test already. <laughs> it was only a matter of time, Ryan. You it know? only took it only took two months off COVID for for it to happen. So, no, <laughs> but let's go ahead and let's go ahead and uh, let's let Nick introduce himself. Nick from Breaking, how you doing tonight, bud? Sure, good man, good. Uh, so Nick from Breaking Bourbon here, one of the three guys uh, behind Breaking Bourbon, BreakingBourbon.com. Uh, 
you all probably know who we are. Follow us for release calendar stuff. Uh, lots of updates on that this year. We got a kind of new system behind the scenes. So trying to do more updates. Reviews like every day. Um, I, I was just taking pictures over the weekend. I was I think I had like 12 bottles. Uh, I had Eric and Jordan have the same thing. So a lot of new stuff uh, coming. And uh, of course, you can find us on all the socials, uh, all at Breaking Bourbon. So glad to be here. I don't think I've been on a round table in probably since like January. I was trying to think it's probably been three. So kind of missed this aspect of uh, connecting with everyone in the bourbon world. Well, we're glad you're back in the tax season. Did they give you a good beating? No. Oh. Man, I tell you, unlike anything else, it, it, insanity this year. So finally coming up for some air here, thankfully. Okay. Yeah, nice, nice. Blake, what's up, buddy? Yeah, thanks for having me. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. I started talking without unmuting, you know. Um, but I'm Blake from Bourboner and Sealbox. Always good to be here. You probably know me as the uh, Cal Ripken of the roundtable. Um, undefeated. And by undefeated, that means I've shown up, whether um, that's late or on time, to the roundtables since we have started. So always fun to be here. As always, guys, thanks for having me. Uh, let's not forget to mention you're also the keeper of bots to make sure that people cannot order anything else <laughs> off a seal box. <laughs> Too soon, Kenny. Too soon. <laughs> The pots are running wild on Sealbox, and uh, yeah, we're combating them with CAPTCHA and everything else right now, you know, he heaven forbid. Um, take a second to like, explain yourself, because I know you get a lot, of, a lot of hate that people think that you sell out of stuff because bots get it. It's kind of a love-hate relationship. You, you love to sell a lot of things, and you wish you had more of it, and, and a lot of people are, are uh, think that they're bots on the sites for certain products, but... At the end of the day, if you've got 600 people on a site at a specific time to buy 50 bottles, like it, it's not bots, it's just, you know, supply and demand. So, uh, yeah, yeah we're, we're kind of working through that on Sealbox right now to try to figure out the best way, because at the end of the day, we want bourbon in the hands of drinkers. But um, fortunately, that's not always the case, you know, so <laughs> it, it, you, you try to stop it as best you can. But you know, I always look at like Nike on their, some of their shoe releases and everything. Like if Nike can't figure it out, Shopify is probably trailing right behind too. So, uh, yeah, yeah. we, hey, we do the best we can. That's all I can say. <laughs> the bots got a drink too, you know, so. Exactly. The, the bots need some, they're thirsty. So <laughs> yes. Nice. And Brian wrap us up here. All right. Thanks guys for having me again. Looking forward to this one. It's, uh, one that was kind of a it, it slowly took hold and then it became everything. So I'm, I'm glad to be talking about this topic. Uh, Brian with uh, Sip and Corn, you can find me on the socials at Sip and Corn or at Bourbon Justice, which as a little uh, self plug just got released in paperback, which I didn't know was a big deal because I'm clueless about book stuff. Says that still, so uh, turns out that that's a, a good thing. It shows good uh, longevity of the book. It's a uh, something publishers don't do for everyone. So uh, thanks to Potomac for that. And uh, hope everyone enjoys the show. Awesome. Congratulations. Congrats, Thank you. Buddy. All right. So let's, let's dive into this. And honestly, I am surprised somehow that this news hasn't leaked out yet. Didn't go rampant in the forums because Ryan and I, we've gone, we've picked barrels at four roses now, uh, I think twice in the past what month and a half, something like that. And while we were there, you know, you go through the whole process, blah, blah, blah. And then after you pick your barrel, they send you all the information that says, oh, okay, just make sure you sign off and approve the label that this is what it looks like. And then get another email, uh, a more of a, a legal email, if you will, that says, we would like you to sign a non-mutilation agreement. And so I'm not going to read it uh, verbatim, but I will bring it up here on the screen for anybody that is live that wants to see it. And this is basically stating that Four Roses is saying that they do not want you to, or they want you to refrain from altering, uh, amending, substituting, or adding to the original brand name or brand packaging in a manner that suggests an affiliation with a third party that has not authorized the use of its trademark or trade name, uh, if distorts or misrepresents the commercial source of the product, violates state or federal labeling laws or regulations, harms the reputation of the distillery or otherwise violates the guidelines set forth in the code of responsible practices by discus basically. Uh, 
I tried to get a little more clarification on this because the way I sort of read it that said, okay, well, you could still do some stickers if they're in good taste. Like this basically just says like, don't use anything that's trademarked. Don't do anything that puts the brand in a negative light. And so I tried to ask for clarification and I said, does this mean like nothing at all? And she replied back and she said, correct. No stickers, no wax, no glitter, nothing on there at all. Now, there wasn't anything that says, if you do that, what happens to it or what happens to your allocation or anything like that. So there's a lot to unpack here. And I think the the way that we should probably start this out is to kind of talk about how did we get here in the first place? I don't think anybody really knows the first sticker that sort of came out or anything like that. Rift Brian, you're up. <laughs> well, that's how we got here. <laughs> but we do know that there are some that pushed the edge and and really kind of pushed it to um, you know, a point where maybe some stuff was not in the most tasteful way to do it. I mean, I remember seeing and just for Four Roses sake, I remember seeing one that had um it was an OESO and I believe it had the two live crew uh album cover on it. I can kind of see where they don't want their brand as associated with stuff like this. I kind of want to toss it over to you all and, and kind of get your your initial thoughts on this before we start getting into some of the like the legal aspects of this that I know Brian's waiting to really chime in here. But I, I kind of want to get your your ideas on, you know, is this a good thing or is this a bad thing? Who gets to go first? You yeah, do. I, I you really to. don't. Yeah, I, I don't want to go first because I know Brian's going to bring in like the actual legal. Um, and so... You know, it's tough because I I feel like from a legal aspect, they can't control that because they've sold it to a distributor, has then sold it to a distillery or to a retailer. And the distillery is, you know, they're two steps removed at that point. Now they can not allow you to have another barrel picked down the road because of it. Um, so I'll let Brian go on all the legal aspect. To me, that's a really slippery slope because a lot of these things, whether you love them or hate them, I'm not big on stickers. I don't think you need to wax everything. I don't, I think it's gotten way too crazy, but at the end of the day, it's helped move product. And it, you know, a lot of these distilleries have benefited from some of these things. Um, I, I always kind of lean back on um, the new riff guys whenever they said, I think it was on the podcast, you know, we put a lot of work into our bottle. We wanted to make sure the bottle looks great. We really don't like it whenever somebody does something additional to our bottle that we put so much time and work and effort into. But if they do it, so be it. Um, so to me, it's a slippery slope because you know I can kind of see both sides. But personally, I'm not going to do anything to a barrel pick that we do. Maybe add a small sticker, but that's about it. But I also don't want the distillery telling me, hey, if you do this, you're never going to do another barrel pick. And I guess they didn't quite say that, but that's kind of the implications here. So that's where I start to have a bit of an issue. So, And let me also say that I didn't have a problem and didn't even hesitate to sign it because I was like, I am not losing Four Roses allocation. And I did reply back. I said, if if somebody does violate this, please let us have their allocation first since we are one of those first ones to sign this. <laughs> Except that we're talking about now, I just threw it all the window. They're going to be like, nope, you're gone. You're done. Nope, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think I think they they understand that this is something that is a, it's a very big topic of discussion because this is a, a, a cultural issue thing that's in bourbon right now that is run rampant across everywhere because people put upside down wax or something and people have uh, very catchy stickers and we've talked about for the longest time that stickers doesn't mean necessarily that it's a good pick or a bad pick or anything like that it's it's something to kind of look at it and and remember that time um but nick i want you to go ahead and kind of give some of your thoughts as well here yeah i it it, it where to begin and and so i kind of lead in with a couple of things a couple of questions too um you know my initial thought when i saw this quite frankly thinking about stickers and brands and the legalities and everything again I'll let brian talk you know to that aspect of it but kind of expected this you know when you look at what's going on out there if you're a brand you got to look at some of these and say we got to make sure we're we're distant from this so we got to make sure we're not. No one can imply that we're that we're part of what's happening with something that is 
copyright infringement or off color or whatever the case might be that might come back and circle back to the brand. You even start thinking about, look, is a, if a brand, for example, social media, you know, retweets or, or shares an image of their bottle with the sticker, are they getting behind it? Are they participating in it? So my first question is, does the, does the brand really care about that, the stickers, or is this just a legal play just to say, look, we're completely hands off of this. We don't really care, but legally we've got to be separated from this. And this is how we're going to do that. And otherwise, I guess, test the limits. We'll see what happens. You know, stickers in general, though, kind of circling back to it. When I look at stickers, the same reason we do them, and we don't put any stickers on the bottles. Our retailer partners don't put any stickers on the bottles. People can put stickers on their bottles if they want to. They'll come with the picks. If they want to throw them away, they can throw them away. If they want to set them next to the bottle, they can. If they want to put it on the back, the front, the side, that's their call. That's completely up to them with that. But what, what it represents to me is just people's excitement about the picks and people's excitement about being involved with, you know, kind of the more intricate aspects of, of bourbon, whether it's doing a pick, going to the distillery, doing a private blend, whatever the case might be. And the idea that a brand wants to come in and say, okay, we want to kind of like squash the excitement a little bit. I don't, I don't, I don't like that aspect of it. So I understand the legal aspect of yes, we have to separate ourselves from it, but I don't like the idea of saying, Hey, we, we kind of want it. You're too excited over here. Let's settle down. Don't put anything on our bottles. You get home, stick her on your bottle. We don't want you to do that. Well, telling people they can't put some, something on their own property once they own it. I'm not really sure how far that goes or what they really, what they really want. So I won't keep going on here. I want to hear what, what Brian has to say too, uh, but I have maybe more questions uh, than answers to this. All right. So I'm up on, I think you guys are, are nailing it. Um, part of it is CYA because if they um, are putting the stickers on the bottles before it goes to the distributor, that's not been passed through COLA. I mean, they're, they're risking themselves having a TTB labeling violation. And frankly, a lot of these stickers violate the TTB rules for what can go on a label in the first place. So not only is it not approved, but you, it would never get approved in a million years. Um, well, obviously, we all know things get past TTB, so maybe that's, that's not the case. But uh, it's, it's also because they can't determine what's tasteful or not. So they just got to got to cut it all off. Um, you know, they, there are some that some stickers that are tasteful. And like uh, you guys are saying, it's you're you're excited about doing a barrel pick. You want to have your information on there about what what barrel it was, where it was in the warehouse, all those sorts of stats. And then you want to have more fun and, you know, either have a picture of the crew who picked it or something like that. Um, you know, maybe we've we've done that. Um, and then it just grows from there. But it's again, it's a, it's a it's a label that's never been approved, and they're not going to be in the business of deciding what's allowable or or not allowable. So they're in a in a bad position where they got to throw some cold water on the excitement of doing the pick, and say just just leave it as the as it is, um, and they they need to distance themselves and protect themselves from trademark claims too. Uh, if if they put on Disney characters, we all know that that Disney really go. I mean, there's a problem with putting a Disney character on a bottle of liquor in the first place. But we all know that Disney really goes after uh, folks who infringe upon their trademark. So they're just being careful, I, I think. So a lot, lot to talk about that. And I want to hear more the comments you guys have or people in the chat do. And I'll maybe weigh in every now and again on the boring legal side of it. Well, it's not that boring. It's very good. But yeah. I know, Ryan, you had you had some comments. I can understand the trademark. You make a very good point about Disney or whoever, you know, coming after them. And and I'm fine with that. Uh, I, I think this just is another, like, can, can these companies just not handle one bad day? Like, if something, one sticker is bad, can they not handle one Twitter feed bad day to where they're like, oh, my gosh, we had one sticker that some rogue crew did that, you know, obviously we're not connected with, we have nothing to do. I, I don't know. It's like, and Brian, you'll probably answer this is like, if I buy Nike shoes and I start putting stuff on them and then I go and post them on Instagram and saying this and that, you know, is that, I don't know. I feel like it's kind of similar, but maybe I'm wrong because it's liquor. Um, but, uh, I don't know. I just feel like it's a bad precedent that, okay, we had two or three poor taste. We got to cancel it all for everyone because of that. And it's just like a bad precedent. That's, kind of happening all over society and i'm 
I don't know. I'm kind of disappointed by it. I mean, the wax is stupid. Stickers are stupid, but they're fun. It's fun for the people that get to go. It's the things they remember. It's something that happened that day. It's like you could probably, I don't have the data to show this, but you could probably look at the data when stickers started happening and the rise of single barrel picks and how popular they were. And these brands just don't get that. And they're just so afraid to like, Ooh, we're going to offend one person on one day and we can't handle all the bad feedback from one day when all you got to do is wait a day and somebody else is going to screw up and they'll, they'll take it over. So I don't know. That's just how I feel. And you can just poo poo on me with your legal stuff and uh, put me back to reality. (laughs) Well, Matt had a good comment uh, in in the thread there about that idiot getting sued by Nike for putting you know blood on it or whatever it was he did uh, for his custom Nikes. And so you, you can't do that if you're going to sell it. If you've got your own pair of Nikes and you want to draw your own design on it and walk around and you've got great shoes for yourself, that, that's fine. You can do what you want to your product uh, that you buy, but then you can't turn around and sell it because you're diluting the value of Nike's brand. Yeah, but the bottle's already been sold. It's already in people's possession. It's it's what they're doing. It's not, I mean, well, you could say, yes, you can't sell it on the secondary market, but that's already illegal anyways. Yeah, so, already can't do that. And yeah. so it's, it's like, well, what's the point? Uh, I mean, I get signing off on the trademark agreement and sure there's poor taste and whatnot. 98% of them have been funny, stupid. You know, it's like, do we really have to do this for everything? Like, can we just deal with the bad apples? If they do it, your allocation's done. You know, why do we have to go through all this? But that's just me. No, I think you make a good point that you you kind of ruin it for the rest of everybody. I mean, we did these picks. Like, I go to a, the, our our sheet that says what the theme and what the sticker's going to be. And now next to our three roses barrels, I have to put no sticker. Well, and, yeah, and, and these people, it's they they come and it's their magical day. It's their Super Bowl. They come to your freaking distillery. They saved up their whole freaking you know year to come visit to do a barrel pick, and they're paying damn good money. And then when they get the bottle, they want to tell a cool story to their friends about it. They want to show them, you know. I mean, that's just come on. I'm sorry, I'm pissed off about it. Oh yeah, I love it. I love it. <laughs> I You're like going, how fired up Ryan is about it. You know that, but but it is true. I mean, like as as much as we see plenty of things that kind of violate you know, whatever it is that the distiller doesn't like that. Well, that's two or three and there. And there's 500 other people who just had a good time with their bottle, enjoyed it. And really the, the distillery can't control that as much as they would like. Um, so that that's the tough part. I mean, I don't like the crazy stuff either. I find some of it. I'm like, yeah, I don't. I don't My wife like just said, "What the hell is going on in there?" She's hearing me yell. <laughs> yeah, <she laughs> so maybe I need to turn it down. But I don't know. It's, <laughs> turn it off. I, I guarantee new riff you, it, for the with even with the you know the riff patina, which was in poor taste. It was disgusting. It was mm-hmm. not right. But I, it put them in front of people that never heard of them before. You know, that they're like, "Oh, put them on a riff, national never, national public." I've never even heard of this. Yep. I had you know how many people told me like. They even li- they live in Kentucky and they they're bourbon drinkers. Like, well, yeah, I can't ever heard a new riff. I've never had new riff till this riff patino bottle came out. You know, it was on Barstool Sports. You know, so I don't know. I'll go back to mute. Yeah, I think that's you know that's the hard part is because I, wasn't Four Roses the one who cracked down a while ago of people who were just you know doing their own samples of hey we're gonna do all ten of the mash bills and we're going to, and and they came out and trying to come down on groups that were, um, you know, had these samples in there. Do y'all remember that? I don't know. I don't remember that. I don't. Uh-uh. So it, I won't name give, some, give us just give a little, a little history then. Cause yeah. So there was, there, there was groups that they, they just do these fun things of like, Hey, if you've never tasted all 10 mash bills, we'll somebody will break down these samples. We'll put the little, sample bottles together, put a logo on it, label on it, and they send them out to people. And basically four roses came out and said, no, you can't do that. And cracked down pretty hard. And this was an enthusiast group. And I just remember thinking like, wow, they, these are like your diehard fans. And I get it. You have to protect it from a trademark standpoint, but is, I don't know, is that where you want to come after people of like the people who are going out of their way to like putting in, I mean, we all know it, it's a pain to 
fill a bunch of sample bottles and these guys are spreading, you know, your bourbon out to all these other enthusiasts and that's who you're going to come down on. But um, yeah, that was three or four years ago, but. Yeah. I'm kind of curious, like if, when you think of something like that, they are, they're continually looking for either maybe problems that don't need to be solved because this is just one of those things that people are advocating for your brand. They are, they are putting it out there and you're not necessarily helping anything uh, in this process. You're kind of, and I don't know what the inside of corporate structure looks like or anything like that, or if they've got somebody that's always trolling the forms, but I don't really know if that should be somebody's job of sitting there to figure out what's going on with four roses in the secondary and the bourbon forms and stuff like that. They could just stay focused on whatever the corporate mission is at hand. Yeah. And, and, and I'm totally fine with the copyright infringement and trademarks that I, I totally get that. That's, I, I to, that's totally fine. And well, what are, what are we talking about though here? I mean, you know, you're talking about uh, somebody that's in there. These are all enthusiast groups. These are all people that, you know, like you were talking about with the, with the 10 different recipes, Blake, you know, these are the diehards, the people that are super into bourbon, super into the barrel picks. They're into it that much that they actually go out of their way to d design a sticker. Or, you know, if you want to dip 150 bottles in wax, I mean, that, that takes time. They're just excited about it. So what are you gaining from going after these people? And is that one-off little group that's doing this one-off thing more or less on their own? you know, something the brand really needs to waste any time, you know, trying to deal with. I mean, why, why can't a brand just say, we're not party, we're not party to that period. That's not us. I, I don't, I don't understand why, you know, people just kind of, kind of, as you were talking about before, Ryan, why can't they just, if, if there's an issue, just step up and say, that's not us. It's an enthusiast group, period. Yeah. People were we didn't do more. It. If you, if you stand up and say, look, we, Instead of saying, nope, we're canceling all stickers because of this one person, you say, nope, this is a vow. We do not agree with this. Everyone else is typically doing the right thing and we're going to continue to do it. But this one person will no longer get an allocation. Well, we're going to. And I think people would respect that more than doing a widespread cancellation of everything. And like I said, I'm I'm on board with the copyright infringement trademarks. Like I get it. You don't want Disney coming after you. They got bigger pockets than Four Roses. But uh not that I'm putting Disney characters on any of our bottles, but I don't know. But I mean, that, that goes back to my clarification question that I really wanted to know that I had to ask. And I was like, does this mean that we can still do stickers in good taste? And they just said, we would ask that you don't do anything. And it was just kind of left at that. So take it what you will. But I know that for myself, I don't want to sit there and, and put allocation at risk. Um, you know, there was also a mention of Shem talked about it earlier that Beam kind of was one of the first ones to start looking at putting a ban on this because there was another group that did a Maker's 46 pick and then they also dipped it in blue and white wax and then put a, you know, Trump Biden sticker on it and stuff like that. And that, of course, is probably going to fire up a lot of people inside of a, a corporate culture as well. One last thought on this. I, I'm willing to bet good money or better bourbon that that this came as a result of Disney or somebody getting a hold of, of Four Roses. And they're just put in a position where they got to upset everybody because somebody either threatened a lawsuit against them or they just realized what the cost would be to, to defend one of these. And it's just a, a bad situation for the people who, who are excited about this and want to share their excitement. And it's been ruined by the Riff Patino type people. And so there was another question that kind of came in is, would we, do we, do we anticipate that this could potentially start leading and, and I guess bleeding out into other distilleries? Spirits of French Lick exploded onto the distilling scene early in 2016 as Indiana's largest double pot still distillery. They employ old world sentiment with new world attitudes delivering the finest handcrafted bottle and bond bourbons to an audience eager for an alternative to the big guys. And their distiller, Alan Bishop, uses historic Hoosier yeast strains, alternative grains, and 53-gallon number two char barrels to bring you spirits with unparalleled quality and depth of flavor. You can find all spirits of French Licks products and new releases on sealbox.com. But don't just take Fred Minnick's word for it. Find out for yourself. Check out spiritsoffrenchlick.com and follow them on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And remember, always drink responsibly. It's time to fling into spring at Total Wine and more. 
where fresh flavors are in full bloom and we're talking bubbly and brunch with Pinot on the porch. So no matter what's on your table, they have the wine and the savings to match. Bacon practically begs for Chardonnay. And which rosé are you feeling today? They surely have your shade. Brighten up your glass with a fresh bourbon cocktail. Mint julep for a Belmont jewel, anyone? And with over 8,000 wines, 4,000 spirits, and 2,500 beers to choose from, you can expect the unexpected. And always at low prices with the best service in America. So what will it be today? Choose curbside pickup or in-store pickup. You can explore more in the store or online at TotalWine.com. Heaven Hill Distillery had 11 different American whiskeys earn double gold honors at the San Francisco World Spirits Competition, including two best-in-class awards. The winners differ in age, type, and style, but the one commonality, the care that went into crafting them. From Evan Williams Bottled and Bond in Rittenhouse to Elijah Craig 18-year-old, their team of American whiskey experts put tremendous care and attention to detail into crafting these award-winning products. For more educational resources and to sign up for their newsletter, please visit heavenhilldistillery.com. And Heaven Hill reminds you to think wisely, drink wisely. Cheers. Do we anticipate that this could potentially start leading in, and I guess bleeding out into other distilleries, starting to enforce the same exact thing um, and, and wanting to say, you know what, we'd really like you to not do this. We're not going to really tell you what's going to happen, but who knows? What, what do you all think is going to happen here? I think, yes. I think you're going to see both ends of the spectrum. I think you're going to see some just follow suit because they see someone else doing it. Just like legal disclaimers. You see a disclaimer, you assume, you know what, we're doing the same thing. We should probably have the same disclaimer or they're doing it. We should talk to our attorneys about doing it. And then I think you're going to have the rebels that actually revel in not doing that and saying we're we're excited about the stickers and the wax and whatever you guys want to do. We're not party to it, but we're excited about that. So I think you might see both extremes on, on both ends of the spectrum on that. So I think it's interesting because, I mean, when you think about all of the the craziness that we see with Four Roses, I don't think I put in the top three of crazy stickers and wax and everything else. So I don't think you'll see people jump on board. And this is kind of like my, uh, you know, hot take of the night. But a lot of the people see it for what it is. It's a small problem on a big scale. And at the end of the day, it's you know, I don't think any of us here are going to be like going to die on stickers and wax and glitter and everything else. But I think all of us kind of want the freedom and don't understand why distilleries would have such a hard time. And so I, I don't think you'll see as many people jump on that bandwagon as we would think. Um, I'd be willing to bet that we don't see another distillery come out those similar uh, agreements like Four Roses. I'll bet anyone a bottle on that one. So I'll take take your I'll, answer off the air. I'll bet you a bottle of bot got I, I think the big five will do it. I don't know. It just seems like it's the safe thing to do. And it's like whatever we can do to make less, you know, even if it's one bad day of Twitter, well, let's just do it so we don't we can avoid it. You think like an you know, Elijah Craig's doing a bunch of barrel picks, or um you think Buffalo Trace is going to come out and say, Hey, we don't want any secondary stickers, marks, wax mutilation to our bottle. I think so. Just cause I mean, what a, they don't have anything to gain from it, even though I could, we could probably prove them wrong, but they think that, and they have all the leverage. They can say, well, if you don't do it, we just, you're not going to get your barrel picks, you know, but, uh, I don't know. Maybe they don't care, but I don't know. I'm shocked by it all. That's all I can say. Well, I know that this has also crossed uh, the day, the desk at Buffalo Trace a, a time or two as well, because I, I can vividly remember one time I got a phone call. I'm not going to mention who from Buffalo Trace called me and said, um, who did that tipsy Buffalo? We're trying to figure out who did it. And I was like, "Uh oh, like, wonder if these guys are in trouble. Because I mean, it basically just, you know, had a drunk Buffalo. Like, I don't know if that's what you want your brand associated with. You know, we, we want to promote responsible consumption. So granted, it didn't seem like it was in bad taste when you look at it as a, as a adult, but as a brand, you have to be conscious of, of how that's portrayed out there. So I, gosh, 
It's a liquor I, brain, though. I mean, <laughs> I don't yeah, know. Yeah, but you, but you have to be, I mean, Ryan, just go read the discus. Like, go read, you know, the Spilled Secrets Council of, of Marketing of, of Alcohol, and it shows you, like, what you have to do. Like, we've, I know Nick and I, we've talked about it before about how you have, what you have to do to have an, uh, an age gate on every single website that you want to make sure that uh, if you want to have advertising on your website, if it promotes alcohol and all this other kind of stuff. Like, so we've, we've gone through and we've, we've read all the rules that, that are a part of it. And so there is a, and, and not to, by the way, that is also a um, voluntary thing to do. It is not necessarily it says that you have to do this or anything like that. They just created a rules that say, this is what you should do if you want to promote healthy consumption and healthy advocating and all that sort of stuff. I guess just can't we use common sense? I don't know. It's, is that not a thing anymore? Like we just got to make rules for everything. And I don't know. That's well, I mean, I'm let's, let's be, let me, I'm let's think about mute. it. Like the sticker thing's been going on for what? Guys, what three years now? Quote, I'd probably say five to four. six. Probably. I mean, yeah, it's like we're we're well, creeping. Yeah, the crazy sticker is probably only three, right? But yeah, but this has been going on for for a while, and so it's I mean, been. We kind had of, a sticker on our the first, the BCR one from about. Yeah, four. that's what that was. Tough. I mean, that's there what was Brian nothing was flashy about it. it. Was those five hanging around a barrel? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sure it's that just we're all so good looking that you know that that passed all the muster. Yeah, it they, they were happy to, to have there. our faces on the sticker in a bottle. That's uh, that's, that's offensive. <laughs> I mean, we prom- that's that's promoting the brand right there. No, I get it. I get it. I guess another thing is we start looking at this is um, how well could it possibly be enforced? Because we all know that there's a few different things. Most comes from some sort of allocation, and that store might either give it to a group or the store does it or whatever. So let's say a bottle leaks out and let's, I don't know if there's any type of barrel that comes out that doesn't have some sort of serial number or anything like that on. I know just now like wild Turkey started putting that information on there, but before nobody ever did. And so if something gets out there and you know, there's not a, a, a breaking bourbon logo or a bourbon pursuit logo or the store's name on it, like how do you, how do you enforce it? Well, that's why that's why I don't think it's necessarily about the enforcement side. I, th- I think it's about the legal protection side. You know, I, I don't know that there would be any enforcement besides just it circling back and them resisting another pick or, you know, worried because they got a call from someone as a result of that sticker floating around. You know, and I think I want to add, too, I know I certainly there's a, a large contingent of people that re- I don't think care about the stickers at all, to be honest with you. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that get excited about them, but I think there's a lot of people that don't really care less about the stickers, too. And, and I think that, you know, that kind of says that's that's what's great about this is y- you don't have to. I mean, it, it really is about the pick. I mean, at the end of the day, it's about the pick. It's about the bourbon. It's about the experience. And if some people it adds value to add a sticker or wax or whatever the case might be. I guess that's the issue is why focus on taking that away? Why focus on the lowest common denominator to, you know, completely rule that out? I'll give you an example. There's a, you know, there's actually a four roses. It's a group of doctors that do a medicinal whiskey and they, and they put a sticker on it and they make it like this old, like old timey medicine thing. And, you know, like they raise money you know, based on, you know, these bottles being sold and that kind of thing. So you're going to take stuff like that away too, you know, so you're going to take away these like fundraiser aspects. Are you going to say no one's allowed to add this sticker now, you know, afterwards, after that bottle, those bottles have been auctioned off. If there's a case like that, you know, how far, how far does this go? You know, how much does the brand need to have their claws in what people do privately with their bottles, basically after they've been sold through and already, overreaching channel of you know distribution i mean it's 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 just ridiculous it's the direction that a lot of things are going it's just frustrating to see something so silly as a brand getting upset about a sticker i mean it's ridiculous i i think you know what's kind of been alluded to in the chats is an interesting point what about the brands who embrace it so you think about like nulu nashville barrel company um you know, there, there seem to be some brands out there that are really kind of embracing those secondary, uh, features. So do they just, do they now have a much bigger audience because it's like, Hey, we got, we got booted out of, um, four roses because, you know, we had gold wax on our bottle. So we want to continue to do barrel picks. So I think that could be an interesting part of it is just to see how they expanded and increased because of it. 
Uh, I do like the comment by at home dad that says, well, now you can try to pull a fast one and find another group's pick and throw a spicy sticker on there, put it on the gram and <laughs> see if you can get your allocation removed. <laughs> that's pretty funny. Yeah. That's a, that's a, that's a that's solid chestnut one right checkers right there. That's a, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Somebody's April always one, April one, get ready. Yeah. Thinking two steps ahead there. Uh, you know, there was one thing that I know Fred had mentioned when we were all having kind of our private chat when I kind of alerted to you all about this potentially happen. And he said that this is, he goes, this is a violation of your freedom of speech. I'm kind of curious, like, it, that's what I was going to say, but I'll go back to mute. I mean, I, I want to uh, No, Ryan, like, the, what do you think? And then, and then we'll let the actual lawyer tell us. Ryan, you go first, then I'll go. Oh, man. See, I don't know the I, I can't have this argument because I don't know the legal part of it. So it's like I could go on a rant and it's not be it'd be totally worthless. But I don't know. It, it's easy for us to say we don't care about stickers and whatever, because we have, you know, and, and a lot of people on the forums, they, they have barrel picks. They do a lot of barrel picks, you know, but a lot of people don't. And that barrel pick is everything to them. When people come to Kenny and I's barrel pick, it is a special day for them. And picking part of the sticker, it not because it's us, it's about them, and it's that's their special bottle, and that's, I, and I don't know if that's freedom of speech because they want their special bottle, but I feel like that should be a freedom. You know, you had your special day at the distillery. I want to put my sticker on it. Tell me I'm wrong, Brian. I, you're you're right from from that point of view, but it's it's not a free speech issue because Four Roses or any of the other distilleries aren't. It aren't the government telling you what you can't say. So if, if it's, if it's just a matter of contract, you're agreeing ahead of time to not put stuff on the, on the bottle, they can enforce that. So here's the question. I got a question for you, Brian, real quick. Yeah. yeah. So say they say we can't do barrel picks or they, you know, they say, can we go after them? Say, whoa, whoa, you're discriminating against us, you know, because of, this freedom of speech or whatever. No, they can we turn the contract. tables on them or no, or can any yeah. business refuse service to anyone? I guess. Well, that you, they get to decide who they contract with as long as it's not based on a discriminatory reason. So if, if it's something because they've been threatened by, I keep saying Disney, I have no reason to believe Disney's threatening them, but it's, I'll keep saying Disney though. If they've got that threatening letter, then they've got a reason to, put something in a contract that prohibits you from doing it. Now, the reality is though, for the, for people who are going on these picks, it's the, it's the time of their life. They've got six bottles or whatever it is they get from the pick. You go home and you guys coordinate getting a sticker on there. I mean, do it, go ahead and put a sticker on your own, own bottle, have, you know, drink a few of them, have a few of them on your shelf and remember it forever and have your sticker on there. What, what they're, what the distilleries are going to be worried about is, is uh, trying to sell it on the secondary market and juice up the price because you've got a cool sticker because they don't want the secondary market in the first place. And they're worried about the big corporate giants coming after them. So have fun, you know, have, keep it within the group, have whatever kind of sticker you want, keep it in the group. One last question before we uh, change to a different topic here is, do you all think this will just take us back to simpler times? If if everybody gets on board, if not, and Four Roses tries to put a ban on this, what could you possibly do next? And how do you like outcompete yourself? Like people are doing custom tubes and ordering off Alibaba and stuff like that. Like what could you possibly do? Well, that's the thing. Could, wh what about a custom tube? What about a box? What about a neck tag? What about um so it's not truly an addition to the bottle. It's just an accoutrement to the bottle. But, you know, I think you go and uh, hire Fred off of, um, what's the thing he's on where, like, you can... Cameo? Cam yeah, you get Fred on Cameo to, to review the bottle for you, and you're all done. Like <laughs> That's all you need. Um, but no, I mean, I, I think you know, you're kind of posing that question, but I think that is a big part of it. Like, what do you do to kind of set yourself apart? That that's the fun part about it. And kind of the, the really deep dive into kind of the bourbon culture. So I don't know what else you do. But kind of, sorry, go right. ahead, Brian. Sorry, Nick. T-shirts. That's all I was going to say. T-shirts. Everybody <laughs> want, gets a T-shirt. I like that. I want, I want double leather tags now. I'm a, 
four roses <laughs> bottles. <laughs> I kind of to that point, though, I, I think the brands are concerned with the association more than anything. You know, I think it's that. That's what I think. So. Somehow there's the association. And then if you're seeing, yeah, I think especially if you're seeing a bottle with the sticker wax, whatever, on a retailer's shelf, um, you know, or or on the website, you know, that could be, you know, the retailer's an extension. You know, it, it certainly looks as if that's how, you know, that's how the bottle's going to come. Um, I, I, I don't see a lot of that on the shelves around here. I don't know if that's more prevalent in some areas or not, but you know, certainly if, if that's going on, I could see where, where brands could take issue with that and whether it's on the bottle as a neck tag or, or a sticker or whatever, I think they'd view it kind of same way. Yeah. There's a lot of great suggestions here in the chat. Yeah. Koozie shaped like bottles. There's, uh, uh but, you know, plus five West Mississippi, plus 10 for a separate sticker. So uh, purple velvet keepsake bag. Yeah, I'm sure there's there's plenty of ridiculous things. Well, that was a, that was a great topic. I don't really have any other kind of questions to, to, to bring on that one. So we'll kind of wrap it up with a, a quick one here. And that was kind of taken. Actually, it was directly taken from Breaking Bourbon. And talking you know, since we're on the single barrel thing is is talking about, well, are blends the next single barrels? And I'll kind of give a, a little bit of commentary why I think it's a it's a really great topic because we all know at this point that choosing a single barrel only gets you uh, at most sometimes 100, well, on average, we'll say around 150 bottles. And there are on average 150 more people than that that want bottles. So if you can come out with a blend that is better than the sum of the parts and you can appease more people than... I think it's a win-win. I, I definitely see this thing as uh, something that could potentially take off. I would think it would be really cool if distilleries kind of followed in the footsteps of Penelope Bourbon, which I know you all have done, uh, I think, two of them now, uh, of being able to do something like that because I know it's a little bit more, more difficult in the process. I mean, heck, it took this long for Heaven Hill to kind of get Elijah Craig Barrel Proof off the ground, but hey, they're there, and I think everybody's really excited for it. But now, if you were to say like, "Oh, we'll take these two barrels and blend them together," and we sat there and you know we messed around during the barrel pick, who knows if they'll be able to do something like that? But I think it's a it's an interesting concept that we could hopefully see in the near future. Yeah, I think you know doing that blend project with Penelope, what was great about them was it was it was a wide open concept, and Blake, you know, Blake was part of that too. Um, you know, there there was no restrictions. You know, we could have gone really low percentage with one of the barrels, and then obviously one of the barrels was going to be used entirely, and that was going to be the limiting factor. You know, for those percentages, we've seen it obviously with Whistle Pig with their bespoke blending program. They have limits. You know, they have almost like think of like bowling bumpers on theirs in a way where you can't exceed certain percentages for different components within that blend. Um, you know, but I think it takes the takes that idea of doing something and making something your own really like to that next level. If you think of it that way, where barrel picks are great, but it, it is what it is with the barrel. Whereas with the blends, it's kind of like there's no limitation. You can make it whatever you want it to be. And, and we certainly found that there's a huge deviation. And as you guys know too, uh, Kenny and Ryan, huge deviation in what you find when you start blending stuff together. And even like Penelope, that's coming from MGP. And you'll certainly hear people, and there's an assumption when you see M MGP sometimes, you say, oh, it's more MGP, more MGP. Well, very different depending how you blend those percentages. You know, it can be MGP and be not very good, or it can be MGP and be absolutely fantastic. And a lot of that just has to do with the percentages you layer into that, you know, that blend. So I could see this really taking off. I could see, like you said, as groups have 300 people, 500 people, whatever it is that's in that group that all want a bottle. You know, it's hard with a 500 person group when you get 100 bottles. 400 people don't get bottles, you know, so that's a challenge that everyone wants to overcome. So I think this is going to be the next thing. There's another good comment here from Matt that says, is Barrel doing something like this? Well, kind of, but what they're doing is they do the blending and then they let you choose from these micro batches or micro blends. My my thought on this is blending so freaking hard. I mean, picking a, a barrel out of whether they give you four or 10, you know, it's, maybe it's difficult to choose between the top three out of your 10 or something like that. But you can, with what they roll out, you can pick out a really nice, single barrel uh, on most of these picks. Some of them you got to send them back and, and leave without anything, but 90% of them, you're going to get a great barrel. Blending, I, I remember a uh, 
a KDA bourbon affair event at Four Roses where they let you blend your your own bourbon and they had all the 10 recipes and little little measuring things to to do little micro uh, blends and then you would get a bottle of of your blend and it's hard. I mean, I made straight out crap out of my blends thinking I would, you know, I wanted OESK and OBSK and I like the V and I'm trying to put that in and it was crap when it came out when it had all of my favorite components. I didn't know anything I was doing. So hats off if someone can do this, it would be really fun to do, especially with Four Roses with all the recipes. Um, but I'd, yeah, I'd like to see it. I think the other thing to talk about is the uh, time commitment for something like this as well, because going and choosing a barrel, you can probably get done in a, well, maybe 30 minutes to an hour. Going and try to do a blend, uh, it, could, it could take a full day, maybe longer. Or months. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's months. the other thing is yeah time commitment and just the amount of buy-in that you have to have i mean I, th I think we had like 350 bottles available for our um uh penelope breaking the seal so like you also got to go in with that but yeah it's it's an eye-opening experience to you know start to blend and just to see how a little bit of different bourbons affects the overall profile like it's it's pretty cool to see you know you're not just deciding like hey a is better than b it's like is five percent of a better than ten percent of a or is it ten percent of a and fifteen percent of b and so that that's kind of the fun part of it too um so you know i love seeing more of that i think that just kind of progresses what everyone understands about how the bourbon wor world works in general and how difficult the master taster and master blenders jobs are so um, I'm, I'm in for that. So the more the merrier. Well, I mean, the, I always thought the maker's mark experience, you know, doing that was really cool. I mean, they didn't, you know, we always kind of had a hard time selling all the bottles cause it was like 200, what 60, 270 bottles. But, um, what happens you go in there and you're like, Oh, I, I like you taste the individual staves and you're like, Ooh, I like these staves. And then I'm going to make this. And then you taste and you're like, well, that's crap. And then what you do is you start looking at, like, well, let me see the computer and all the blends that people I respect have done, you know, and then you start working off that. And, uh, yeah, it's blending stuff. I mean, you can make something unique, but you'd also go and waste your time, <laughs> you know? And so, uh, a single barrel is a lot more efficient, a lot more easier to do. But, uh, if, if you have the time and the pallets, you know, like Blake and Nick, you know, to do it, then follow me. <laughs> trying to say not so much Brian. <laughs> <laughs> well, Brian already admitted he sucked. So, <laughs> uh, but no, I, I think it's all fun. Whatever you can do to, to make something unique, I'm all for. For sure. Uh, there's one other comment here from Bourbon Assess that hasn't Woodford had a two-barrel blending program in place for a while now? Yes, typically when you do a Woodford Reserve double oaked, it is a blend of barrels that you are getting out of there. So good little uh, note there. But I think this was a great roundtable, everybody. We covered two great topics. And yeah, I'm excited to uh, get this one out there. I, I'm I'm nervous now when everybody in the industry listens to this. And, I'm banned uh, for sure. <laughs> we're we're gonna have to start sending apology letters at some point. <laughs> hey, Mandy, everyone at Four Roses, this was not directed at you. It's just uh, society in general. So I I apologize. <laughs> no, uh, no, we love you, and we want to come back and pick more six floor OESVs. See ya. <laughs> yeah, uh oh, tier six coming soon. You heard a or a Bourbon Pursuit Patreon members. It's a <laughs> it's a oh, man. Uh, sticker, sticker free, free. <laughs> sticker free. Yeah, sticker free. We don't even need a sticker for that one. So screw that. So how about I know that's the thing. Would people even know what tier six is if it wasn't even for the stickers? You know, thing. So, but I well, it says it. Uh, it'll say on the bottom of the of the bottle. I know, so. but people hype it up more with stickers. So uh, I digress. Everything's everything's the hype machine. That's what it all falls in. It's gonna We're come putting, with a Rolex, right, guys? That, that's yeah. what I heard. <laughs> <laughs> We're putting Blake to sleep. He's been yawning quite a bit, so let's yeah. get him get him to bed. Uh, yeah, I'm trying <laughs> to stay awake. <laughs> yeah. But guys, I want to say thank you again for for joining us tonight. It was a pleasure. Let me go ahead or let you all go ahead and give a little bit of an outro where people can find you. Nick, go ahead and go first. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, guys, for having me. Uh fun topics. I think we're gonna see a lot more on this. Um Nick with uh, Breaking Bourbon, breakingbourbon.com. Find us on all the socials at Breaking Bourbon. And uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. A lot of, lot of great comments in the chat tonight, too. So that's that's awesome. Yep, absolutely. Blake? Yeah, I'm Blake from Bourboner and Sealbox. Uh, always fun. Always enjoy being here. So um, really good topics. I felt like that one was 
you know, we, we didn't go wide. We went deep on the, on really two topics. So that was a lot of fun and really cool to see everyone's input in the chat as well. So thanks for having me and uh, find me at bourboner and sealbox.com. You can register your bot at sealbox.com. So <laughs> make sure you go there too. And close us out there, lawyer. All right. Thanks. This, this is fun. I mean, it's, it's where I live. So it's another, another good one for me. Enjoy it. Uh, and enjoy the dose of reality too, because it, it can get to, when you think about all the laws that people are trying to comply with and threats from big companies, it's, it's kind of, it, it kind of can throw you for a loop. So Brian with Sip and Corn, all the socials at Sip and Corn and bourbonjustice.com. Thanks again for having me. Fun one guys. And I forget that, Brian. So thanks for reminding me and being there to uh, <laughs> shut me down. No, I'm no, no, no. I only shut you down when I, as what was it on, on advice of counsel? I oh yes, yes, on uh, sourcing where we're yeah. sourcing stuff from. Yeah, yes. I recommend that you shut. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah <it was> fun. <laughs> we need that more often. These yes. lives are hard to make that happen. <laughs> But again, thank you everyone for tuning in and make sure you follow Bourbon Pursuit on all the socials as well. Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, and make sure you subscribe to Bourbon Pursuit wherever you get your podcasts. And if you're watching on YouTube, hit that subscribe and like button as well, because we're always publishing all of our podcasts there and you get all the video podcasts there as well. But cheers, everybody. Thank you so much. And we'll see you all next week. <laughs>